turn to number 15, we're going to sing Revive Us Again. I believe in this day and hour we need God to come down and revive us one more time. Amen. Remain standing and hold on to your hymn books for a moment. Our ushers are coming forward, and uh, we're going to receive an offering here in just the next song. And while they're coming, every penny that goes into this offering will go to help cover the expense of this meeting. We appreciate all of those who are helping. I appreciate Brother Nicholas and Brother Caleb and playing the piano and the bass this week. There's so much that goes into this, and we're so thankful for all the help and the hotel rooms, the accommodations. Every penny you give helps us to enable these men and their families to come and be with us during these days and nights of meeting. Not one red cent that you give goes towards Victory Baptist Church. It all goes towards this revival meeting. And so uh, thank you in advance for your giving. Brother Luke Crow is making his way up to the altar tonight in the pulpit. And I want us to take him to the throne of grace. I appreciate Brother Luke Crow. And he's the youth pastor here at Victory Baptist Church. But I told him, I said, it's, you know, God's really given him something, not just with our youth, but the youth of our county. And uh, he's not just for our church, but there's a lot of churches that have confidence in Brother Luke. And he's pulling for you. We've told you before from the start of the meeting that we're not after your members, not after your money. We just want a move of God. And uh, so I sure do appreciate Brother Luke and his heart for God and his heart for young people. And he's a coach on the football team, and they're playing their game tonight. He's up here. He told the coach, he said, I've got to be on Mount Victory this evening. And I appreciate Brother Luke coming up here, and I love him. And I want him to take us to the throne of grace. And after he prays, then they'll pass the place to sing this next song and get right on into the service. Brother Luke, you come. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. Lord, I just want to thank you for being so good. Lord, I want to thank you for the privilege, Lord, of what you've let us see already. But God, I want to thank you for the privilege of what we're going to see. God, I believe you're in the setup business. God, I believe you don't waste anything. And God, you put a lot of effort. Oh, God, you set up a lot of things, Lord, for nothing to happen. So God, we're believing you tonight. God, to do a mighty work. God, Lord, I pray you do a work only you can do. God, it's not about the man. It's not about our churches. It is about the precious Son of God. Lord, I pray, Father, he would be magnified tonight in every aspect of this service. Oh, dear God, I pray, Lord, you direct their eyes, their hearts, and their minds to the precious Savior. Lord, I pray tonight, Father, you would take this offering God, I pray, Lord, you'd bless the giver. And God, Lord, I pray you would take this offering, Father. Lord, that you would use it, God, to do your work. Oh, dear God, we're believing in a big God. Lord, you're not broke. 
Oh God, Lord, just like Abraham saw, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are the God that will provide. And God, we're trusting you tonight that you will provide for every need. Lord, take this offering and bless it. And God, we come to you right now. Oh God, we're in agreement with the thrice times, holy God. Help us, Lord, not to pray amiss. God, help us, Lord, not to waste time praying prayers that will not get answered. Oh, God, we're claiming the blood, Lord, that you would settle in on us tonight. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are the honored guest tonight. Oh, we pray you'd settle in on us like the morning dew. Oh, dear God, have thine own way. Oh, God, if there's going to be anything done of eternal value, God, you've got to do it. Oh, Lord, it's not in man, but it is in the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, wilt thou not revive us again? Lord, if revival's going to come, it's coming through the precious work of the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, we pray tonight you would open the eyes of the blind. Oh, shine that glorious light through the fog bank. Oh, God, peel back the veil from the rise and let them see their lost condition. And, Lord, let them see the precious Savior, just like the serpent, Lord, high and lifted up in the wilderness. Lord, let their eyes see Jesus. And, God, to the born again, Lord, give us a deeper appreciation of Calvary. Oh, God, that you get glory. Not in us, oh, Lord, not in us. But unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and thy truth's sake. And Lord, my prayer tonight, God, that you would make it clear for the sinner. Lord, just like Jesus spoke to that Samaritan woman at the well. Whoa, as he said, I that speak to thee am he. Whoa, let them know it's you that's tugging on their heart. Whoa, let them know it's you that wants to save them. Oh, Jesus, I pray tonight you'd reach down further than what we could reach up. Oh, God, we pray you would touch the singers as they sing here in a moment. Oh, God, we pray, Lord, that you would use them, God, to shift the atmosphere. Oh, God, that you would tenderize our hearts to the message that will be preached tonight. Oh, God, have your will tonight. Lord, I pray right now for Brother Heath. He's the man for the hour for such a time as this. You've given us Brother Heath. Lord, I pray, Father, you'd illuminate his mind. I pray you'd guide his thoughts and guide his lips, hide him behind the cross, dear Lord. And God, let him preach in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit tonight. Lord, the fields are white and all ready to harvest. God, I pray you'd harvest the souls, Lord, before it's too late. Lord, they're ripe, Lord. God harvest them, Lord, before they go rotten. God harvest them while they're rotten. Lord, I pray you would honor and reward Jesus' suffering on the cross. Lord, we love you. God, we pray you bless the remainder of this service tonight. We love you and ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. As they're taking up the offering, grab your hymn books, turn to number seven. I feel like traveling on.
seat. The Daughters of Calvary are coming to the platform. And uh, thank you, church, for the wonderful singing tonight. And if you stepped outside of the tent, you could hear echo down through these mountain hollers. 
And uh, thank the Lord, what a great witness that is. People ask all the time, what's going on on top of the mountain? Well, we say just come out and find out for yourself. We thank the Lord so very much for the Daughters of Calvary. And, you know, we were talking about how last year they were with us on the very first Friday night of the meeting. And we were talking before church, and they are asking how it was going this week. And I said, well, everybody keeps saying the same thing. It's almost like week number six. And Brother Travis Curlock said it like this today. He said, I feel like I went to bed last night, woke up, and started all over again. And we thank the Lord for how the meeting is built and all that God has done. And like Brother Luke said, it's not unto us. It's all to God. We give God all the glory. You worship with the daughters of Calvary. After they sing, Brother Heath Williams is going to come. We thank God for this man of God. Has he been a blessing to your heart this week? We thank the Lord for him. You worship God tonight.
blessed Holy Ghost led me to the light there at the altar as I prayed. Holy Spirit of God I've never been to Israel in person not physically but that night I took a trip and I found myself at the foot of Calvary's cross I looked up and I saw that man hanging on the cross for my sins bleeding at night I looked around at my mama who is telling me the Bible story right before Easter and I said mama why is he on the cross? She said, for you. I found myself back in my bedroom in my heart. I said, Lord, if you've done that for me, I'll give my heart to you. And by faith, I trusted Jesus Christ. I asked him to forgive me for my sins that come to my heart. And guess what he did? He saved me. He moved inside of me. And I am changed, saved. There's a reason why we stand up on our feet. We wave our hands toward heaven tonight. Because we know what Jesus Christ done when He saved us. We were on our way to a devil's hell. And deserve to be there this very moment on this night. 
But here we are under a gospel tent singing the praises of Almighty God, rejoicing that we're saved. I don't know what you need tonight. But as they sing, if God has spoke to your heart, child of God, maybe the Lord has showed you tonight where you were when He found you how He saved you and the miracle of your salvation and the length that God went to to get you and you might want to just come and say thank you Lord Jesus for saving my soul you might be here tonight you've never been born again you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior but tonight the Holy Spirit of God has made Jesus real to you and salvation sweet in your soul and you say, I don't want to go no further in this service without making sure I'm right with God. Tonight I'll give my heart to Jesus. Whatever the Lord is speaking to you about tonight, just mind Him. That's not just a cliche statement. 
I was as blessed as anybody. But it took the same grace of God to save me as an eight-year-old boy in a preacher's home as it took for God to save somebody out of the gutters of sin. Don't you think for a moment tonight that it took more or less of God's grace to save you? I was saved as late. I told you I was a little boy, and I struggled with that for years until about two years ago, God helped me with something. God did not just save me from my sin, but Brother Brent, God saved me from what I could have been and would have been. If it would not have been for God's grace, I would be in those trenches of sin. I would be sucking a bottle. I would be in a no good place tonight had it not been for God's amazing grace in my life. So what I'm telling you tonight is let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Give God praise for saving you tonight. If you were raised in a Christian home, praise God for that. It took the same grace to save you. Sing that last verse one more time. Let's worship God and give God glory for saving your soul. Praise God. Didn't you enjoy the ladies tonight? Amen. I appreciate most of all the God that's around here. Amen. Amen. Brother Daniel helped me with something a while back. He said, sometimes we say things and repeat things without really thinking about them. And I heard folks say before, and I've even repeated it, that, well, you can't sow, you can't sow seed when the wind's blowing. It may be true on the farm, but it ain't true at church. There ain't no better time than when God's around. And uh, God chose preaching, and that's what's in my heart, and that's what's in their hearts. And so we want to be sensitive to the Lord. These altars are always open. These folks are in no hurry. Folk been coming every night. If you hadn't been here, God tells you to come. You just come on at any time. It won't hurt my feelings at all. Do you mind the Lord? Acts chapter number 15 tonight. Acts chapter number 15. Boy, God's a help me over there. I don't know about you. I thank God for the night that the Holy Ghost led me to the light. If you don't know anything about Holy Ghost conviction, you ain't saved. I didn't stutter. Baptist man got confused in the last 50 years, but this Bible hadn't, and neither has God. If you can't tell me how you found out you was lost and how the Holy Ghost spoke to your heart, I got no confidence you're going to heaven. You can't get saved till you know you're lost. 
That is the work of God. Salvation is of the Lord. Thank God Jesus died for the whole wide world. Thank God the Holy Ghost is coming by. Speak in our hearts, but it will be on His terms. That's why old timers would preach that and folks would tremble because they'd be terrified. When God was around, they may never get another opportunity. We've been lied into this lax thing that God's desperate and He'll take you any time however you want to do it. If He don't knock, you won't get saved. That's Bible. You say, that bothers me. Well, I hope it does because if it bothers you, I'm trying to keep you out of hell tonight by the power of the Holy Ghost. So I don't know about all that. I tell you what, Brother Percy Ray, Brother J. Harold Smith, several other them men of God of yesteryear is a lot better then than it is now. They said they believed that 50% of the old-fashioned Baptist churches was probably lost, at least. It's probably a lot more now. I ain't trying to confuse nobody, but eternity's too long to be wrong. If you can't understand and worship over that song, the devil may be lying to you. There's a lot of folks that said a prayer or sign a banana, become one of the bunch, got baptized, said some prayer, mama wrote something in their Bible, and there's been nothing in their life for years. That is not the salvation of this Bible. I like what Brother Larry Winkler said. He said, a pastor asked him, said, are you for lordship salvation? He said he chuckled. Pastor said, why are you laughing? He said, I thought you was kidding. I know how to get quiet in here. He said, there is no other kind of salvation. He's either God and Lord of your life or he ain't God of your life at all. This thing's crazy. That's why we're in the mess we're in. Why well, believe in a God that you won't be perfect and you ain't got to do none of it. It is of the Lord. It's free. I believe in all that. I'm saying you are, but you better hear me tonight. Big, something as big as God that the heavens can't contain. You get saved and He dwells on the inside of you and you tell me in 20 years there's been no victory, no difference. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Old things are passed away. That don't mean we're perfect. But listen, I got a new want to on the inside. My new man craves this. Adrian Rogers said heaven's a prepared place for a prepared people. Oh, I pray tonight God will show you some things. Lead you to the light. Acts chapter number 15 tonight. You stand with me. So we read the Word of God. Acts chapter number 15, verse number 36. The Bible says, Some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the Word of the Lord and see how they do. Barnabas determined to take with them John whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren... Unto the grace of God. I want to look at this young man tonight by the name of John Mark and preach on this thought by the help of the Lord for a little while. The God of second chances. The God of another chance. Let us pray tonight. Father in Jesus name. Oh Lord we love you. <laughs> God, I bow before you. God, I recognize I got no abilities to get this done. I'm way beyond myself, way over my head. But, oh, Lord, how we thank you for the privilege. God, how we love these people under this tent. I pray 
you would let them know in their hearts, Brother Ethan, myself, these men, we love them. God, I ain't trying to hurt nobody tonight. God, I ain't trying to offend anybody. But God, we need the truth. Dear God, it's time we wake up. God, we work out our own salvation. God, I pray for deep conviction. God, save the lost. Bring home the backsliders. Prodigal sons and daughters. Bless them on the live stream that are watching. Dear God, touch those of us that God's forgive us. We forgive ourselves. God, make it real in their hearts. Help every one of us tonight to leave different than we came in. Oh, God, empty us and fill us. Send that vacuum. Bind the strong man. Enter his house. Steal his goods. Oh, the devil won't turn loose. Nobody lets you make them. Open the ears. We pray for that drawing power, God. Oh, Lord, how our hearts yearn for them days of old. God, that pulling power that would shake people alive. Dear God, tonight we pray you would just persuade hearts and woo them to Christ. May tonight be the night that they call upon the Lord and ask Jesus to be their Savior. God, help us tonight. Touch the saints. Touch the lost. Do for us what we can do for ourselves. May Christ be exalted. Not a man, but Christ. Not a movement, but Christ. Help us tonight, God. Guard our lips. Help thy little servant to only do what you want me to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Well, me like most other preachers that you've probably ever heard, you have always heard preachers, if you've got a real pastor, if you've got a real man of God, I stress that tonight now. I'm talking about if you've got a real man of God that loves the Bible and loves you enough to preach her straight with fire in one eye and a tear in the other eye. You got a real man of God, they're going to preach to you. You need to live right. You need to do right. Stay out of sin. Anytime I get the opportunity, and God will let me always try to at least have a portion. When I preach to young people, to tell them the damage of sin. Because I've been on both sides. And the devil don't play fair. And sin doesn't play fair. And so we preach it strong because we love you. We preach it straight because we love you. Because we understand what this world and the devil in your flesh will do in your lives. But may I just tell you something tonight. Although you hear me tonight, I don't want nobody to get the wrong idea. Brother Ethan already touched on it. The greatest testimony in the whole wide world is the fact that some young kid got saved before they did a bunch of outward sinning and they trust Christ young and they live for God their whole life. Married in the church, stayed in the church, walked with God and that's what I'm praying for my kids. You say, well, that ain't a dynamic testimony. That's because we've lost our ever-loving minds. We ought to shout more over a young person that's now 40, praising God. They've never been out in the world, and they don't know liquor, and they don't know drugs, and they don't know the scars that some of us do. That is what we ought to really shout over more. They're all good. But that is the best testimony by far. But I will say this to you tonight. We live in a messed up world. For most part, a whole lot of us carried baggage in here. Some of you, you're still under the load. Some of you, it's in your past. And you know what it's like. And I'm glad tonight to report to you that God doesn't just love those that get it right when they're young. God loves those that mess up and those that blow their shot and those of us that walk out. They even love seeing those in church and walks out and they wind up shaming and trampling the blood. There's a God that'll have mercy. He has mercy on those. He loves you tonight. Probably because somebody's been touching heaven on your behalf and moving the heart of God. I'm glad there's a God that failure is not final. There's a God that has grace tonight. There's a God that can still restore. There's a God that can bring you home and forgive your sin. He can save to the uttermost. He can bring the prodigals home to the uttermost. He can forgive you and give you some things back the devil's wrecked in your life. And let me say this and then I get into it. I want you to understand something tonight now. We're preaching about John Mark. We're not talking about somebody that was all alone by their self, had no help, knew nothing about God and he messed up. 
I mean, we can almost understand that a little bit and say, well, God, I mean, God never showed him none. He didn't have much to work with. Sure, he got mercy. Did you hear something tonight, though? He's the son of Mary, the one that was financing much of what Christ did. Very wealthy woman, stayed at her house, used it for many things. He's cousin to Barnabas. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying he had a great family heritage. And he still blew it. I come to tell somebody tonight, this has been strong on my heart all day long. It don't matter who your preacher is. It don't matter who your mom and daddy is. It don't matter what church you go to, what Bible you carry. You can have every single thing right, and I praise God for it. But heritage is not enough. It ain't enough to save you, and it ain't enough to keep you right with God when you are saved. you got to have your own prayer life. you got to have your own Bible reading time. There comes a day mom and daddy can't do it, and the preacher can't do it. We've got a whole generation of Baptists. I Listen, I don't pick on nobody else because Baptists is all I know. I've been one all my life. Our prayer list are a mile long. And we pray for four minutes after we talk about Biden, the weather, and everything in between. I somewhere not too long ago, man, they pray, uh, we talked about this foolishness for 15 minutes at church. And then we started praying. I was just getting warmed up, preacher. And they said, Amen. We might have been two minutes. Why is that? Because we, we don't, we, 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 we're totally against the Catholics, but we act like them. Most of us, we say, I got trouble, let me call the preacher. Why don't you pray? Why don't I pray? I got a pastor, I'm a local church evangelist, and I'm honored for him to pray, but listen, sometimes if I'm in a real fix, I can just get down and call on God. I ain't against prayer list at church, I ain't against you calling your preacher, but you hear me tonight. Can't nobody pray for your burdens like you can. We got the Holy Ghost that prays and Christ said come. We don't have to have no man. We don't have no mediator down on this side. We don't have to go through a pope or a priest. We can talk to God if we're right with him. And that's how we're messing up. That's how we're in the mess we're in. Because if we ain't praying and if we ain't reading, they cannot do it for us. It will kill them. It will kill you. It is not enough to have any kind of heritage. It's between you and God. From salvation all the way to living for God in your life. There's three things we find. In what happened to John Mark and how God had mercy on him. I give them to you. And take my seat. Notice with me first of all. The failure he faced. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them. Who departed from them. Here's what happened. First missionary journeys. Begin. Paul's going to crisscross the known world and take the gospel to everyone, to every tongue, Gentile and Jew, preaching you for you're saved by grace, faith alone, not of works, no more Judaism. Salvation is the grace of God. Whosoever will, let them come. And boy, they take off on this missionary journey. And John Mark, Jewish history says, was the young man with the two senior men, and he was the note taker. He had the job of all jobs. He was probably envied by a lot of other preachers. He got to travel, he got to see, he got to feel, he got to hear, and he was writing it all down. But somewhere along the way, this young man that was converted under Peter, who, who listen, who absolutely was excited and enjoyed what he did, somewhere along the way got blown out. Most commentators in history says this, he got offended at Paul's teachings of grace and to the Gentiles. You remember Peter had an issue with the same thing and Paul had to talk to Simon Peter about it. They had to have a confrontation and a talk. So probably John Mark is struggling with the same thing because he was converted under Peter. So he get listen, he's immature. Some people even say he might have been a little soft the way he grew up, rich and wealthy. All them reasons. Maybe he got homesick. There's a lot of things you could say. But at the end of the day, for whatever reason, he got beside himself and he got mad about some things and he went to the house. Can I give you a verse? Proverbs 13 and 10 says, Only by pride 
cometh contention. You understand that if your pastor is not outside this Bible, you have no reason to be fussing at him. There is no fight. Sinners are going to hell. Who cares what color the carpet is? Ladies and gentlemen, I love you tonight. Hear what I'm telling you. The judgment seat is coming if we're saved. I fear that as much as anything. How are we going to explain to God? Well, I quit and went to the house because they didn't let me sing as much as, as, much as so-and-so. Well, they built the building different than I wanted, so I stayed home. But God, you understand. Well, I didn't get my way, so I went home. God didn't answer all my prayers, so I quit. That may sound good down here, but when you behold the one who bears the marks in his body because he loved you so much to go all the way and he loved me so much to go all the way, what excuse will really work? What are we really going to say? We better live with judgment day in mind. John Mark got blown out, got mad at the preacher, full of pride and unbelief and went home. I'm afraid there's a lot of people they got their reasons, and some of them may be valid if you want to talk fleshly. But ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, there's too much at stake to argue over silliness. One of the main reasons we can't have revival is because preachers can't get along. I hope I don't make anybody mad, but I'm just going to tell you what God's putting in my heart. Who in the world couldn't get behind this? Old-fashioned singing, Bible preaching, King James Bible, got everything just right. There's nothing offensive to anybody. There's nothing but just a biblical, very simple platform. And yet there's people that won't come. There's preachers that won't come. Some may have valid reasons. I don't even know anybody up here, so don't think I'm preaching anybody. I have no idea how to even get around town. i got to use a GPS to get to Newland. But do you see what I'm saying? Our people are struggling because we're struggling. We can't even pull for each other. We do what we want to. We have all excuses in the world. But if we really want to do something, we make a way. And if we don't, we don't. And the fussing and fighting has killed a whole generation. And what we've done is we've all become a bunch of John Marks. And we've turned Paul and Barnabas against each other. And now everybody's fighting over what's going on. And if you preach for this guy, then you can't preach over here. But if you go over here and preach for this guy, then this crowd. And then this little camp says, well, if you're with them, you can't be with me. Where in the world biblical separation is a Bible principle? I ain't talking about dipping colors. I ain't talking about preaching and compromising for men that are embarrassing the ministry. I'm talking about this thing of secondary separation and foolishness over preferences is not in the Bible. Time's running out. Folk going to hell. Christians need hell. Prayers need to be prayed. There's too much that's important to do to fuss and fight over things that don't matter. It's time we understand folks need God and we need to see what's right and get about doing it. Feller asked me one time that I preach for Southern Baptists. I just tell you like it is. I said, well, sure. Some guys hide. I got nothing to hide tonight. If God ain't embarrassing me doing it, I'm not going to be embarrassed in front of you. Got upset about it and then told me how much he loves Dr. Percy Ray. Listen, if a man loves God and they got a church that the Holy Ghost is in, why wouldn't you go? If we don't, it's only because we fear somebody more than we fear God. The Bible says a fear of man's a snare. If we could get our eyes on God, we're so consumed, worried about each other, it's hard to give God any time. Only got to please one person. Eternity's a long time. I don't want to go to the judgment seat wrong. 
It's time we lower ourselves down and get honest about things. I ain't talking about compromise. I'm an old soul. I believe it's straight. I'm embarrassed. I ain't recovering from nothing. I've told y'all. I love, I thank God for our history, our heritage. But the foolishness is killing us. There's a lot of good men that are in churches. I don't care if it's a Bible church, a Baptist church, if the Holy Ghost is on them. I mean, if you draw the lines this time, I don't know why I'm hung up on this. But hear what I'm telling you tonight. we got to have some unity if we're going to see God move. You say, well, I'm against all that. Then you got to throw Robert Sheffy out the back door. And he had a better prayer life than any of us. you got to throw Whitfield out the door. you got to throw Edwards out the door. Moody certainly had some unusual ways. Toss him out the door. Billy Sunday that everybody wants to talk about that draws those lines. He certainly wasn't in the kind of church we'd want. Throw him out the back door. I'm just trying to tell you, God don't look by our little silly lines. and He doesn't live by them neither. The mark of the Holy Ghost is a defining factor. If God's for you, I'm for you. If God's for your church, I'm for your church. I don't care about all the other details. Hey, we're, we're on this thing together tonight. The failure he faced. Some of you here tonight because of religious failure like I've just been preaching. And then some of you are failing tonight because of just the sin that's destroying your life. There's religion that's tearing people apart. Church, church, frustrations, bitterness, the issues of ministry, all these things. Then on the other side, there's a lot of folks, the bottle has you gripped and you can't do nothing about it. Right. Prescription drugs have absolutely went through the roof in America. I mean, people I'd have never dreamed can't put down a bottle of pills. Doctors love to prescribe them. They have a reward system. The more they give out, the more benefits and cruises they get. Folks really need something, I'm for it. But, buddy, they'll load you up, wrecking people's lives, then sin grips them so hard. And they want to get out and they can't get out and failure's looming over you and you're about to lose everything. There is spiritual wickedness that is consuming people's lives. Hey, look at what pornography is doing. It's everywhere. You would be shocked at the statistics. Have an anonymous survey at your church. It would blow your mind if everybody to told the truth of what's going on. Satan is everywhere. Brother Ralph Sr. said it well. In the 80s, he said, I feel demons crawling up in this nation I have never seen he said I feel for the young men of that day how much more is it now we're living in darkness like we can't comprehend and there is a lot of failure that we're facing the devil's beating on every hand folks are losing on every hand there ain't been real revival so the power's limited and people feel like there's no hope and they're just failing you say preacher how come I keep staying so bad? Maybe the same reason Mark, John Mark did for a while. Do you know that Jewish history says that that young man that was seen running from the Garden of Gethsemane specifically mentions him? Say he was running away? Jewish history says that was John Mark. Folks, he's been running a long time. He was running in the garden. Now he's running from the mission field. He got blown out before. He gets blown. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that until we get tired of running, you ain't going to get no help. Whether you're running because of church stuff, or whether you're running because of sin in this world and foolishness, it don't matter. The devil's always going to have us running. And isn't it amazing that when we get in a mess, it's so amazing how our flesh and the mind games of the devil's crowd will somehow convince us it's best to run from God instead of to God. You say, but preacher, I failed. I can't. That's the, that is a very important, as important as any time to run to God. Somebody said one time, I don't want to go to that church. They got hypocrites. Well, isn't that the best place for them to go if they're going to get help? Because somehow we've convinced ourselves that when we're mess ups, you don't come here. You just keep running that way. But the further you run, the worse it gets. The failure he faced. I wonder tonight, what you running from? 
What's got you on the run? What's the devil driving in your life and keeps you running? The failure he faced. Number two, the fellow for labors he forfeited. Look at verse 39. And the contention was so strong between them that they departed asunder. Here's where my heart's at on this. Here what I'm telling you tonight. There's a cost to inconsistency. Probably what's hurting our churches more than anything, and I know all the pastors will shout right here. What is hurting our churches more than anything is there's not a level of consistency and faithfulness amongst God's people. Every time something, they blow up and then they blow down. They go up and then they go down. You can't build something on, on a roller coaster ride. There's got to be some stability. But because John Mark wasn't stable, whatever reason, him and God was not on the page they should have been. God certainly would have had him doing these things. Somewhere he missed the mark. He messed up in his life. But hear what I'm telling you. Anytime you do that, it won't just cost you. His inconsistency caused two dear ministry soulmates their friendship for a while. When we play games at the foot of the cross, it costs a lot of people. When you quit praying, nobody else may know, but God knows and it'll cost other people that you love. I can't tell you the amount of people, Brother Tim, that'll come talk to us. And they'll say things like this. My kids are in a mess. Please pray. Well, tell us what happened. Well, he's in church. We was raising them right. But some things went on and it really wasn't a big deal, but I let it get a big deal and I got mad. Their teenage years, they wasn't in church. And now we're sorry and we're back, but they want nothing to do with it. You would be shocked how many times we hear that over and over and over. Inconsistency cost a dear price. And now the two of them are blown apart. And Brother Scott, what breaks my heart the most is when Paul sails on his second missionary journey, it should have been the three of them together. What all did John Mark forfeit by running out on God? That's my real heart of what God had me to come preach tonight. What are you going to forfeit if you decide to run on God? If you run away from real old time religion, I'm talking about where a preacher really preaches to you. And people pray for you at church. It's easy to want to leave because there's pressure in churches that believe God. Everybody loves to have somebody that just tickles their ear. And that's why the churches are filled with all of that. So-called churches. It's more easy there. There's no devil to fight. He ain't worried about it. You don't have to hear that challenging preaching that bothers your heart. Young people, the devil's going to give you every reason. I can't imagine growing up the day you are with a cell phone in your hand to do all of that and all the pressure to go here and all the pulls to go over there and then all this religious delusion where all these preachers are saying, oh, you don't have to preach like that. That preacher's mad. He's just too old-timey. He's outdated. He ain't relevant anymore. And everybody's pulling you in a hundred directions and saying, but you'll enjoy this or you'll do that. You're pulled physically. You're pulled spiritually. You're pulled in every area of your life but I come to let you know something tonight I know that this may not be what is most popular to the world but it's still precious to the Lord His Spirit bears witness with that tonight He loves that kind of singing He loves this kind of church He loves these altars being used He loves us calling out on God He loves us doing the things of God why? because that's what He died for for church to be this way that is the the heart of Christ and I'm just going to tell you tonight it'll cost you something to be in something like this at whichever church you attend there's a lot of good ones here it'll cost you something to be there but it'll cost you more to leave so I don't know why you're preaching this 
Because I preach to teenagers all summer, every summer of my life, and it's the great privilege. I love doing it, but I am tired of watching girls at a 14 years old hold a mic up here and sing with the Holy Ghost on them. Only for three or four years later, when some knucklehead boy comes by, they wind up running out and losing everything and winding up in a mess in their life. And young men that used to know what was right get pulled down by some so-called preachers. That bad to put their pastor down and so discord amongst them and turn them against the things of God. And young people wrecked by sin, young people wrecked by religion, and folks walking out. I want you to know that I didn't love. It will cost you some precious memories. Brother Ethan, we've talked about this many times. Me and Brother John, we went to Bible college together. Can I be honest with you? Had about a hundred in our class when I was there, all different years from freshman to senior down at Victory. And I'll be honest with you, more never made it than did. You say, oh, well, they probably just didn't have a whole lot of talent. I say this tonight honestly, and I mean, I'm not trying to be some kind of extra humble. I'm just being straight up honest with you. Most of them that didn't make it could preach way better than I could in Bible college. Matter of fact, they used to preach, and I'd be scared to death to get up there. I couldn't even hardly raise my voice. I was so scared when God first called me. And they would, they would cut at us, and they'd make fun of us. Man, they, I mean, I'm just telling you, they, they had a whole lot more talent, had a whole lot more knowledge, but that ain't enough. Charisma won't do it. It ain't enough. And that's the same for all of us that feel church peace. Folks that leave, it don't mean they weren't talented. It don't mean they weren't smart. It don't mean they weren't successful. It don't mean they just didn't have half a brain. The devil's taken down greater than us. Sometimes, Brother Brian, I sit down and we'll go somewhere like Myrtle with my preacher man. Our pa would take us down there, man, and we just get in some deep waters. And I'll be enjoying God, Brother Terry, but then somewhere along the way, Think about how me and so-and-so used to do this or me and so-and-so used to do that. And they're not there. And my heart shatters into a million pieces because they're my friends. I love them. And I've watched as they have sold out what should have been. They should have been the John Mark that was taking the notes and living it all and making all kind of memories. And then one day launching out for God. But instead, it's all thrown away. And now they're all somewhere messed up in some ism, like the preacher said. Boy, you better be careful any of them isms. They're destroying us. We don't follow no man. We follow God. Say, well, who you follow? I'm a Bible Christian. I don't fly a banner for nobody but Jesus. Got mixed up and pulled around everywhere. Got off in some kind of higher intellectualism or over here in liberalism or whatever else you want to call it. And when they used to be taking notes with a tender heart, yeah, come on. not because there's some terrible person and we're better. Oh, no, no, don't you think that? Right. Pride goeth for destruction. Yeah. But the devil got in that thing and messed in their mind and did something to mess the whole thing up just like John Mark. But young folks, listen to me tonight. You walk out, you'll get every opportunity when you turn 18. You'll get every opportunity. Can nobody make you do nothing? If you want to pay your own bills, you can walk out the door, you can go live on your own. I mean, listen, I've been this thing long enough to know this. Preachers can't make people do anything. And there comes a day we can't make our kids do anything. You can't. You can do your best while you can. But young folks, there's going to come a day you're going to get your shot. And I wonder, are you going to have enough from God you're going to keep your notebook and keep following and going for God? Are you going to go and get hooked up with the wrong crowd? Or are you going to go to college and throw everything away while you're trying to get a career back up on everything your parents and the man of God taught you? Well, there's a lot better than us. I can go down memory lane in my mind. I can see them singing, Brother Scott. 
I can see them shouting on the mountainside of some of them early youth camps. I can remember seeing the Holy Ghost on them and shouting for hours and never breaking stride. I'm talking about in God. Nobody singing, nobody doing nothing in the middle of the night. Just God. And I ain't even sure they even in a sure enough Bible preaching church now. Listen, when we walk out on God, we forfeit the most precious things in our life. I give you this when I'm out of the way. Notice with me though, as bad as all this sounds so far, it gets better. Notice with me lastly, the forgiveness he found. Listen to this verse in 2 Timothy 4 and 11. Paul here, the writer says, only Luke is with me. But watch this. Take Mark and bring him with thee. I've been here in my life. I saved at seven. I did most of my sin. And after I was saved, I got mad and I left God and I ran in the world. <laughs> running from the call to preach, running from the things of God. But I love the fact that this is the God we serve. For He is profitable to me for the ministry. Just because it ain't right when you start or just because there's a problem in the middle doesn't mean there isn't a God that can fix some things in the end. Now there's some things we can never take back. But I'm glad that God's grace is sufficient and the Lord it can restore in our lives and do some things. John Mark somewhere when he went back home, Peter must have helped him. The church must have helped him. He got lined back up and then he went with Barnabas by the second missionary journey. And then he proved himself while he was gone. And Paul's type A. He's mister. We got something to do for God. Get in or get out. I can relate to Paul. I appreciate that kind of fire and direction but sometimes it can be a little rough however you want to line all that out about who was right and wrong here's what I know by the end of his life the old man of God said I can see that God has proved him and he said I want him to know that I think something of him and I appreciate where he's come to he's profitable for the ministry here's what I come to tell you tonight there is forgiveness in God my wife reminds me of this all the time, and I'm thankful she does. It's such a truth that traps people. Sometimes we say things so harshly that we leave young people thinking that if they fail, mom and dad, listen to me. If we're so harsh and we're so intimidating to the point that if they fail, they can't even tell us something ain't right. We should be a church where people can come and get honest with God. And when God forgives them, we do too. And forget about it. Folks that fill them pews every Sunday, we're all just a bunch of sinners saved by grace. We've been where they was at before. From the person steeped in religion to the worst person running the streets. I'm glad there's a God who can reach all the way down and come to where we can't come to and pull us up when we can't fix ourselves. There is forgiveness in the Lord. Failure is never final with the Father. As long as God's still pulling on your heart, as long as there's breath in your lungs, as long as you've got a heart and a desire, you wouldn't be here tonight if there wasn't some pull inside of you. You would have never desired this being messed up and the devil wrecking your life. The reason you're here is because there's a God that loves you and he wants you to know he can forgive you and the devil is a liar. You may say this. You say, yeah, but... Man that messed up like John Mark so much, he's like me, probably never did nothing else for God. I beg to differ. He authored the second gospel. He served with Timothy in Asia Minor, helped plant churches in Egypt, worked with different preachers. Paul used him again. He became a great and mighty thing for God. And watch this now. You look up his name in the Greek and it means Yahweh is gracious. I'm about done tonight. But you need to hear this. Don't let the devil rob you of this right here. 
You understand, Brother Luke, <laughs> that when he was in his mother Mary's womb, John Mark, he was in here. Nobody knew anything about what his life would be like. God put it in their heart what to name him. All them people back then prayed and God would give them names for their children. God picked his name out and said, Yahweh, that's God. Yeah. Yahweh is gracious. Yeah. Yeah. Because God knew before he ever had a problem that God was going to have a, gra a plan of grace. Yeah. He said, one day, I, I know where John Mark's going to go. He's going to be immature. He's going to mean well, but he's going to blow out. And he's going to be immature. And he's going to run home for whatever reason. But I want to let you know something tonight. God let him know in his life long before he ever even was looking for it. I bet John Mark looked back on it. We never know on the front side. But boy, you see a lot of things when you look behind you. I bet he looked back. And he probably got overwhelmed when he realized that God put his name on him. And God put grace in his life before he ever even needed it. And I come to let somebody know tonight that same God died for you on Calvary. Stamp grace on your life. He knew the mess you would be in. Had a miracle already picked out. He saved folks like you. He could save more. Nothing is impossible with God. He knew what you would be. And he died anyways. He stamped grace on your life. If you failed tonight, God can forgive you. Don't stay down in the ditch. A just man rises up seven times. Come to God and say you're sorry. Get it under the blood. Run it to Calvary. You don't have to get any worse. Just bring it to God. There is a God that's gracious. He'll forgive you. He'll forgive you. I said he'll forgive you. The devil's a liar. He's rich in grace and mercy. I wrote this quote down. Maybe this helps somebody tonight. Sometimes you can't trust your conscience. You must trust the cross. If God's forgiven you, ladies and gentlemen, you better forgive yourself. The devil will always be reaching way back yonder and trying to slap you in the head with it. But if Jesus died for it and, you've, and you're saved and you've been forgiven and you've asked Christ to forgive you, it doesn't matter what the devil says or what kind of feeling you think's floating somewhere. If God says it's forgiven, the cross stamps the approval on it. It's been paid for. It is forgiven. But there's a lot of church folk, Brother Cody. They're good folks and I love them and they really want God. And God's forgive them and they're living clean now but they won't do anything because they won't just forgive their self. How you know? Because you're always talking about it. You understand God chooses not to remember. And the devil always talks about it. So if you're talking about your past or anybody else's, you're not acting like God, you're acting like the, the devil. Because if you're saved, that's all he's got to try to hold you down from doing something for God. It's saying, God can't use you. You're a mess up. God can't use you. Young person, you sold out to God before you let somebody down. You didn't do it all just right. He's always playing these games. But I come to tell you tonight, there's a God that's full of another chance. Say, preacher, I messed up several times. Girls, y'all come if you don't mind. Preacher, I messed up several times. You're here tonight, ain't you? Why'd you come? Because God must still be wanting to fiddle with you. God still has you on his heart. Maybe I could just say it like this. God don't wink at sin. There's a price to be paid. It's better to stay at the house. We know that from the story of the prodigal. We know all them things. But listen to me tonight. God ain't near as hard on us as we are on ourselves and each other. Just think about the night. And this is what keeps me from trying to swell up and be some kind of Pharisee over somebody else that maybe hadn't learned some of the things that I've been taught. And that pride wants to rear up. You know what I always think about? 
All them times Jesus was so patient with me. Remember times as a young preacher? Man, have some mercy on some people for heaven's sakes. We all do things, say things. When Brother Daniel first started letting me preach for him and have me come around every blue moon, he'd be gone and preach a Wednesday or Sunday night or whatever. I, I'm very sure because I found some of the old recordings God held. There's some times that I directly know I preached something unbiblical. I do. I went back, I heard it. I said, oh, Lord, that ain't right. But I didn't mean to. You know what I can hear on them recordings? I hear him over there shouting. You think he didn't know I was wrong? The big picture. It's the big picture. You can't hurt, you can't help people always stepping on their jugular. Keeping dirt on can't help people always dwelling in your past and their forgiveness. God ain't got a mean spirit. He's not a grouchy God, and I mean that reverently. God doesn't sit up there, young people, and just say, man, I hope they mess up again because I really want to stop them. Man, I really want to give them a beat over the head. If you're a good daddy tonight, you whip your children when you have to, but you don't enjoy it. Tears, tears me alive sometimes my wife will say honey I need your help I know what that means and I say <laughs> they ain't old enough to know so I can say this I say Lord I hope it ain't that girl that's real hard you daddy say amen I hope it's the boy <laughs> but you know what I found with my kids when I get ready to whoop them I see a genuine look in their eye, Brother Terry, that they're sorry. Right. They lay their head over and say, Daddy, I'm wrong. There would be no reason to whoop them. What would be the point? If they mean it, man. God knows when we're playing games. Just like our kids. Crying because you get caught, not crying because you're sorry. Repent of it. But when you're sorry, God's a better father than any of us. He don't just keep his belt up there, Brother Luke, and say, I ain't missing my shot. Buckle in first. I'm about to lash him. You don't get no twisted pleasure. He'll be the first one to come down with you. Meet you right where you're at. Wrap his loving arms around you and say, if you're sorry, it's forgiven. Let's talk about where we're going from here. There's a God that'll forgive you tonight. If you're lost, he'll save you. If you've messed up on God, he'll fix it. If you've been too hard on other people, you can fix that too. Wherever you fit in this story, we all somewhere. The God of another chance. Let's stand all over the building. The ladies are going to sing. You mind God. If you get in this altar and you need some prayer help, just raise your hand. I'd love to come pray with you.
of you that are in your seats folks are coming we ain't close to done but listen while these are praying I want you to hear what I'm telling you nobody else has to know how you failed I'm talking to all age groups but especially teenagers God knows what you're up against and God is full of grace and mercy don't let the devil lie to you you bring it to him don't let it get no worse tonight if some boys talked you into something, some tell God you're sorry. Young man, if you've done something you shouldn't have done, your parents don't know, you're running with a crowded school, the ball team. You looked at something you shouldn't have looked at, it slipped up on you. Don't run from God, run to Him. He can forgive, He already knows, He's just waiting on you to get honest. Mama, Daddy, you don't have to get public, just get honest. He don't have to shout it from the rooftop. He don't have to bust the whole thing apart. You can break it. It don't have to get no worse. Yahweh is gracious. Boy, God's here tonight. Say, folks need to get some forgiveness and get clean. And lost folks, you better come while he's tugging. You don't know if there's another shop. Just love you enough to tell you the truth. Well, there's a lot of us. We need another chance tonight. God's willing to give it. That's why he told me to preach this. He's extending the opportunity. Don't run from it. While they sing, you run to it. I beg you. We're praying for you. We love you. Now there's been times I walked away from the Lord. My sins grew many and my heart grew cold. God, go, Fellowship was broken and go, I felt so all alone.
in God. Well, my soul's still troubled. My heart is so heavy. There's some people here tonight. God's a messing with you. He's a squeezing on your heart screens. He's a talking to your soul. I don't want you to leave and miss God. Sing us another verse, whatever they want to say. Oh 